Hi out there and welcome back to another edition of our Sacred Conversation series. I'm Steve Youngkite and I am joined this week by Reza Mansour and Gufran Alababidi. They are both friends from the Berlin Mosque and I have had the pleasure of traveling to the Middle East with Reza and Gufran a number of times in our Tree of Life journeys. It's one of the greatest pleasures I have in my role as a minister here in Old Lyme. Gufran currently serves as the president of Tree of Life, and she has been a voice of conscience regarding Palestine, but also regarding the refugee crisis in Syria, among other places. Syria is where Gufran was born and raised. And Reza is a cardiologist at Hartford Hospital, and he serves as the president of the Islamic Association of Greater Hartford. Together, Reza and Gufran have been some of the primary links in the partnership that our community in Old Lyme shares with the Berlin Mosque. And so I am so incredibly grateful to count them both as friends and I'm grateful to both of you for joining me on this uh, conversation. Now, the questions I've been pursuing ever since COVID-19 became a daily reality have to do with what sorts of things we need as human beings to make it through this crisis with our humanity intact and maybe even our humanity enhanced. And so in this space, we've talked with leaders and activists, we've talked with physicians and those in the mental health world, and we've spoken with several other folks in the arts as well. And this week is an opportunity to learn about the resources that another faith tradition, Islam, provides for a moment such as this. It's an opportunity to understand our shared spiritual heritage with our friends in the Muslim community. We'll hear a little bit about the practice of Ramadan and how COVID-19 has changed the way Muslims are celebrating this time. And we'll hear about the spiritual journeys of these two dear friends. And so Reza and Gufran, once again, welcome to this sacred conversation. And thank you so much for joining me today. Um, let me begin by asking the two of you, how, how are you and how are things in your, in your lives? Reza, I know you're working in a hospital. Gufran, I know you have five, count them, five children in your home uh, with your Well, husband. plus while, so it's six. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, this is what Isla keeps telling me, so I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> she counts me as one of the kids, so. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so, so I'm just curious how the two of you are, are doing. I don't know, Gufan, why don't we start with you? How are things in your... Sure, sure, Steve. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's great to be with you and, you know, with the community of the Old Lyme Church. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we have been affected as everybody else with the coronavirus. And uh, yes, with my five kids, they are staying home. Yep. practicing the distant learning and that sometimes get putting us in overwhelming situation uh, you know dealing with uh, so much homework uh, and contacting teacher behind screens uh, uh, while also had to stay home for a period of time and now as many you know just like uh, many others that he went back to work and that also another stress that when he goes and come back to to the house you know so we start turning on the alarm, take a shower, change your clothes. And, you know, we're trying to stay safe. We're trying, we're trying to be as cautious as we can. Um, but overall, it's going well. Um, we're, we're doing our best to stay healthy. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's going. Until now, it's going. Well, yeah, uh, kudos to you for, I mean, we're, de we're dealing with three kids in our household. It's, uh, you know... I'd say uh, moderately challenging. Um, so adding two more to that mix, uh, I can only imagine. So um, yeah, kudos to you and Wael for, uh, for, for getting through this time together, uh, mm -hmm. all of you. And Reza, I'm curious about you. Um, I mean, you've been going to Hartford Hospital, I assume, uh, yeah. many days and um, tell me how it is. So first, thank you again, Steve, for inviting us. It's wonderful to be in Kong conversation with uh, old Lyme as usual. I think when I was there in person uh, giving the sermon, I remember an elderly gentleman passed, passed out That's while right. I was giving the sermon. That's right. And I had to end my service or sermon and go and <laughs> help him uh, get up. And, and that was a challenge. So this time, hopefully it'll be a little smoother. 
don't want me to worry about this time. <laughs> That's right. Um, so it's, it was actually, it, it, to be very honest with you, it was very scary. Uh, firstly, the hospital told us that we were going to be given these special N95 masks mm. and you know, they wanted me to shave. And after I did all of that, they said, by the way, we don't have enough N95 masks, so you're on your own, uh, which was really quite challenging because um, we're, we're a private practice group and we provide cardiology services for the hospital, uh, but we are still considered a private group and they needed as much of the PPE as possible for the nurses and the doctors who were full-time uh, in the hospital. So, um, Amazingly, the community, the Muslim community, you know, I was having these um, twice a week. I used to do an update to the community on what is going on in the hospital with regard to COVID-19, as well as what to look out for and how to take care of yourselves. Yes. And as part of that, I was just mentioning and I got so many N95 masks, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, I'm actually providing them to frontline workers in the hospital as well now. So it's been uh, really uh, a helpful thing because those masks are really um, what we need when we're going out and taking care of those patients. Yeah. Um, the way the structure of our practices is, is that there are five cardiologists that go to the hospital. So we do one week at a time. And um, before that week was particularly challenging, but by the time I started my week, I actually had the N95 plus I was giving it to all my colleagues. So I had some sense of security when I started. Um, but the fear is still, obviously, lots of people were dying. We were witnessing a lot of disease. A lot of my patients would call me and tell me, I'm going to the hospital. I'm having all the symptoms of COVID. We saw uh, many of my patients pass. Uh, and that was very difficult um, to be able you know, to see somebody a week prior. And then the next week, the intensive care unit calls me and says, by the way, your patient is in the ICU. Not doing well at all right. and you start panicking thinking oh my god did I get exposed you know to that patient you know you, you all these different thoughts come to your mind um, because Aida has asthma she has uh, other conditions that make her a little more prone to be um, a, a patient who would be a little more challenging so I've actually socially isolated at home yep. so I have my own bedroom I use separate bathroom towels everything that I do was until last week uh, completely separate. Wow. Um, but with time, I realized that, you know, I don't have to be that aggressive anymore. I've, I'm very cautious when I go out. As soon as I come in, I do what Kofran mentioned, which is take all my clothes out, put them straight into the washer, go straight into the shower uh, and change into new clothes. And I keep my shoes outside so that there's very little exposure to the family. Um, and I'm the only one doing the shopping as well. So I'm the only one really exposed to the environment. And as long as I'm careful and I'm being as cautious as possible, I think the whole family has been relatively safe. Yeah. Okay. Um, but with time and with actually meeting the patients and actually uh, realizing that it's, yes, it's, you've got to be very careful, but uh, if you are careful, that you don't get infected. And so that's been reassuring to know that if you're careful, you actually um, can prevent yourself from getting infected. Yes. Um, unfortunately, many of the hospital doctors also got infected because the CDC initially said, you don't need masks. And it was double messages that were coming from the CDC, which was very difficult because um, they had to walk a tightrope because they didn't have enough PP. They knew that. Yeah. Um, but the messaging that they gave actually misled a lot of especially physicians, frontline workers. And yeah. so many of them got sick. And um, that was challenging as well, because now, even at the moment in Hartford Hospital, we're doing much more as consultants. We're doing admissions and discharges and stuff of yeah. patients, despite the fact that we're consultants. And we weren't used to that. So we had to learn these new roles because the hospital uh, full-time physicians were, were falling sick. Right. Oh, my gosh. Well, one of so the things like, that's, um, yeah, it's harrowing to hear some of those stories. And um, uh, I, I guess in some ways I'm not surprised to hear it um, based on all the, the news reports that we've all been reading about the um, shortages of equipment, shortages of masks, um, kind of the underpreparedness of our healthcare system to deal with something like this. 
Um, but yeah, that the, the fact that you've been facing it head on, um, um, you know, is harrowing to hear, Reza. Yeah, it, it's challenging mostly because I think the countries like South Korea and Taiwan got it right. They did the, you know, the tracing, the testing, and they got it right. And we had the opportunity to crank up that stuff, but somehow, I mean, we have the CDC and the, you know, we have the organizations that are capable of doing it. It's just that we were caught on the wrong foot and we just didn't crank up uh, for various reasons. And, uh, you know, one of them was the president was underplaying this as well. So, you know, on multiple levels, things just fell through the cracks. And it's sad to see, uh, you know, 85,000 people have lost their lives in, in America because of a preventable issue. And that's really the challenge. Right, right, right. Well, let's talk a little bit. I, I, I want to, I guess I want to ask both of you, what, um, what difference your faith makes um, in a time such as this, facing a crisis like this? Um, I mean, Reza going into work and facing really dire conditions like that. Um, I, I know both of you are deeply, deeply influenced by your faith. And I know, um, um, I don't know. I know you're passionate about about your faith. So, so I don't know, Gufran. I don't. Why don't we start with you? Like, what 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 difference does it does it uh, do, or has it made uh, to you to have a strong sense of uh, faith, to have a strong identity as a as a Muslim woman? Yeah. So, I mean, absolutely, my faith has helped me a lot, especially in this tough time. Yeah. Um, if you allow me to jump directly immediately to the you know, our Holy Quran, where we get a lot of resources from it. Yes, and yeah. So, I mean, there's one verse that it says, um, I don't have to say the Arabic part, but I will say the English that surely we, we shall test you all with something of fear, hunger, loss of wealth, life, fruit, and tithing to those who show patience. So we grew up on this concept that life will have a lot of challenges, a lot of tests, to all of us in different ways. Yes. So we kind of, we're always prepared for something harder might come. And we always prepare ourselves that, to follow the footsteps of prophets, righteous people. How did they react to those you know, tests that they went through? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we looked at, you know, we look at too many stories of prophets uh, that they went, you know, one of the wonderful example that Mary, uh, we call her our mother Mary also. Uh -huh. So Mary, you know, uh, she's a great example. Whenever I feel myself I'm in trouble or I'm in, under pressure. So I remember the story of her when she went in a huge test, uh, when she got the, the order to carry uh, Jesus. And then she took a little, you know, Eastern place from everybody. She was you know, shut away from everyone. And then when she came back with that baby, everybody were asking her, you know, tough question. And, you know, uh, some of the question as it was revealed in the Quran, it says, um, sorry, uh, oh Mary, what can, you know, what can we understand from the situation? You, you are the sister of Hera, uh, your father was a great person and your mother as well. She was a wonderful person. And, you know, she was very patient. She was very calm and she showed all the trust in God. So, and she just indicated to the baby in the cradle. And at that moment, we all know the story that the prophet Jesus started to speak to, to the people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I look at that situation. How did Mary, peace be upon her, reacted? Mm -hmm to such a, a huge test that she was put in and God has chosen her in particular to be in that part. And many other prophets like Prophet Musa, you know, against, you know, Pharaoh or yeah. Prophet Ibrahim challenging his dad, telling him what to worship and to stay away from, you know, worshiping idols that they cannot see, they cannot hear, they cannot help in anything. Um, if you look at all those examples, all of them show patience. All of them show calmness, you know, in their reacting and acceptance of God's will. Uh -huh. 
in all those tests. So this is exactly, you know, what helped me go through a tough situation. Yeah. I look at those stories. I try to learn from it. I try to, you know, amplify some of these, uh, what I'm learning from them in my life and that making the life much easier for me and for my kids as well. Uh-huh, uh-huh. No, yeah. I think it's very, very interesting. Um, I mean, I've been doing the exact same thing with our congregation here, just helping helping um, all of us to, to remember these powerful stories that are a part of our, our heritage. And it's a common heritage that we share with, with all of you. Um, um, and I think those stories have such profound power, especially now, um, that we can, we can uh, um, lean on those stories and take such strength from them. So yeah, hearing, hearing the story of, of Mary in this context, or hearing the story of Moses in this context. Yes, yes, yes. From the beginning of life, from Adam to yes. Prophet Muhammad, they all went through challenges and tough times, and they all showed uh, their special way in responding. But if you look at all the responding, it's always carried that acceptance, first of all, and then showing patience. Uh, even uh, Prophet Muhammad himself, he went through a huge challenge when his own people rejected his message, rejected him. Mm. And all what he did is complained only to God in a nice way that when he asked God, he said to God that if you don't carry an anger over me, that then I'm all good. And while, you know, however, the blessing of you, oh God, it's better for me. So I mean, just to accept, if we put ourselves in acceptance of what God has chosen for us, yeah. And to others also. I mean, it make a huge difference in our life. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, thanks, thanks for all that. That's uh, sure, sure. really, really helpful to hear. And Reza, I'm curious about you. Um, I imagine going into the hospital every day must take a great deal of courage and strength. And I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering if if faith is a place that you turn to. Um, for that um, kind of strength. I mean, people turn to all kinds of things, and I. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, it's it's interesting. So I, I need to go probably back to my childhood in Sri Lanka where, um, you know, Muslims are a minority, 8% uh, of the population. And, and I grew up with mainly Buddhists, but Christians and yeah. uh, Hindus. And so um, I always questioned, okay, so what's the difference? I mean, why am I different from a Buddhist to a... So I actually began to read a lot. Yeah. And did you grew uh, up... Were your parents Islamic? Like, so did you? My pray? parents were Muslim. Yeah, uh -huh. my parents were Muslim. Yeah. Um, but you know, in my class, obviously, the majority are Buddhists. Uh, Buddhism is seventy percent of uh, of uh, Sri Lanka, and Hinduism is second, and then Islam, and then Christianity. So it's you know the the populations are largely non-Muslim. Yeah, and so it makes you uh, question more. Uh -huh. And so I read a lot about Buddhism, and I yeah. found that the sayings of the Buddha were very very. Uh, inspiring, and you know, you 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 began to really contemplate. Okay, so what's what's there in Islam? And uh, when I started reading the Quran, it it embraces you. You know, it challenges you and embraces you. It kind of pulls you in. And I can't remember any other book doing it to the extent that the Quran does, where God doesn't tell you one story. He'll pull a story in and then use it as an example of patience and so the story of uh of france uh, quranic court was beautiful you know god says this is the way life is going to be it's going to be challenging there is going to be the loss of life the loss of wealth fear so so these were feelings that uh, and i quoted that particular verse on the first time that i did the talk to the community because that makes you realize that this challenge is not something that's not foreseen. God foresees this and tells you, you're going to be in these situations. And I think if you read it in advance and you know that this is life, then you can face it knowing that God is actually in control, mm -hmm. that God has put this challenge to you to see how you react. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that all these different prophets and messengers of God had similar challenges. Yeah. Jesus's challenges were, you know, obviously so severe that God in Islam raised him up to himself because he didn't want to, him to be crucified uh, according to the Islamic uh, perspective uh -huh. in uh, uh, soil that was un, uh, un, 
unworthy of people at that time. The Jews didn't even walk on that land because it was for the crucifixion of the worst of the worst. So God didn't want his Messiah, the messenger of God, the messenger of the gospel to be crucified in this way. So he raised him up to himself. But you could have imagined how much he would have suffered before that point. Yes. Similarly, Job, the prophet, Ayub in Islam, uh, you know, he, he suffered a lot. And a beautiful story is that his wife told him, you know, you're a prophet of God. Ask God. And he said, I feel embarrassed. God gave me such beautiful health for 40 years and he gives me a few months of a challenge and I'm supposed to go crying to him. No, I have to be a little more strong. And these stories give us a lot of confidence, you know, saying, okay, the prophets faced so much and they were not phased by it. They kept their faith and really going into the Quran and it, it builds that sense of faith that when you're faced with a challenge, it doesn't throw you off. Yes, yes. And so these verses came to my mind, especially the one Sister Olfran quoted, that God is going to give you something of fear and the loss of life and the loss of property and the loss. And so we were actively seeing it and I've never faced this kind of a challenge. I mean, this challenge was uh, unique and very, very intense. Uh, you know, uh, it was like, we didn't know what to do. We have no treatments for this. People were dying, young nurses who were healthy and not obese and thin and active were dying. And we were you know, told, oh, by the way, so-and-so passed. And, and it was really, really, really intense going into the hospital, you know, I'm over 50. Uh, and so automatically we're at a slightly higher risk when a young nurse who's low risk has just died. And you're like, oh my God, you know, so we didn't know who this bug was really affecting. Of course, the elderly was a, were affected more. People who were, you know, had diabetes and heart disease were affected more. But uh, these, this bug was, we had no treatment. So we were going in the blind, uh, not knowing how to treat these people. We weren't adequately protected. And so it was very challenging. Uh, and so, you know, faith does play a huge role because as in Christianity and in Islam, this life is a short challenge. And then the life of the hereafter mm. uh, in Christianity, Jesus refers to the kingdom of God is forever. And so this life is meant to really strengthen you and build that connection with God so that you can be close to God in the kingdom of God or in heaven or in paradise and as in Islam. So I think that um, this life you live, as the prophet said, like a traveler. So you, you don't put a lot of um, your, you don't put a lot of um, weight on this life, mm -hmm. but you use this life as this, a stepping stone to build that beautiful connection with God. And I think that's what this brought much more intensely to me. And I think the fact that I was reading the Quran and kind of building that faith connection helped me a ton in this last you know, couple of months. Yes, yes, yes. I can only imagine like how, how difficult that would be, but I can only imagine too that um, having this these deep resources of faith that you've built over many, many, many years of practice. Um, this is the kind of stuff that we all need right now. Uh, and to mm -hmm. not have that right now, I think, um, um, I don't know, I worry, I worry about what it means to go through this. I know, I, I, I couldn't imagine. The yeah, I couldn't imagine stuff. the challenge if I didn't have that kind of support, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's, it's a huge support because you're going in, you know, blindly thinking, okay, I may not come out of this alive right. uh, when I go into the hospital if I get infected. And then God puts things in perspective. This life is really a stepping stone. And, you know, you do the best you can and you trust in God. And then you hope for the best in the hereafter, which is where um, as people of faith, Christians, Muslims, and, and at least I think Orthodox Jews also believe in a life after, uh, uh, in a hereafter. Um, that's really the reward, right? This is the challenging part. And then you, this is the test, if you will. And then you get the results in the next world and you celebrate and you're in the company of those who are blessed in the company of the best of Jesus and Muhammad and all those amazing personalities that I would love to meet uh -huh. and get to know them as, and hear their stories one-on-one. -on -one. You know, it, yeah. it's very, um, 
I don't know what what we are told of the next world sounds so amazing that uh, I don't know why we get so scared when death approaches, right? <laughs> but we do. It's challenging and it's tough. But really, the reassurance is from God that this life is only the the means to a beautiful hereafter. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it um it, it raises an issue for me. Um, I mean, we have a lot of different different views in Christianity about what, what eternity might mean and whether or not that's actually a state that one achieves after death or whether it's something that we experience here and now. But, um, but the thing I say at every single funeral, um, and that I think is really, really important to say now to everybody is that in life or in death, we belong to God. Mm. Um, and, and we can trust God to receive us into God's care um, when the moment comes. And while I don't know what that looks like exactly, I don't even know what that means exactly. Um, I feel confident speaking those words uh, uh, um, in funerals and in other situations as well, um, because I, you know, I feel I, I feel some kind of assurance that that's true. I feel some kind of assurance that it's so. Mm -hmm. um, I can't prove it. Can't um, uh, describe it in detail, but. Uh, but I feel an assurance that it's so. And that makes all the difference in a moment such as this, I think. I mean, and that's exactly what we say when we hear of a death. We say, surely to God we belong mm -hmm. and to him we return. So it's, yes. Yes. it's not, you know, it's not this difficulty. He created us and he put us here and he is embracing us back to himself. So right. Right. Uh, those words that you utter are exactly what Muslims say as well. And it's not yeah. unusual because... It comes from the same source, from, from a very similar message, source, yes. from yeah. the messengers that you know brought down the revelation, yes. um, the Torah for the Jews, the Gospel for the Christians, the Quran for the Muslims. And so, if the source is the same, then I think we look to the same right. um, source for for protection and and comfort. Amen. I love that. I love. That. I know. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Hey, well, let's talk a little bit um, about, uh, so you know, Reza has alluded to his, you know, childhood in Sri Lanka and uh, growing up uh, as a Muslim uh, in a largely Buddhist context and kind of gradually emerging into that um, identity as a, as a um, feeling very certain and secure about, about uh, his uh, identity as a, as a Muslim. But Gufran, what about you? You grew up in Syria and uh, was religion always a very important part of your life or did it become more so over time? How, what, what's, what's your faith journey been? Yeah, Steve, so I was born in a family that I can consider a conservative family. Mm -hmm. uh, so the religion was an important part in my family. Uh, I have learned a lot since I was little about uh, Islamic studies and Islamic uh, knowledge, you know, in my home first from my father, my mother, yeah. and my sibling. I was the youngest. So everybody was the teacher for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, you know, do and don't and don't and do. Mm -hmm. So after that, you know, through the years of education in your country, absolutely, you're, you know, you're getting many hours every week about the religion. So I had many Christian friends in my class and we used to separate whenever they, they're gonna take their lesson about, you know, Christianity and I'm gonna take my lesson uh, about Islam, but we get all together at the end, you know, studying other um, subjects. Yeah. So I, I never, you know, to be honest, uh, at that time, when I was young, or younger, yeah. <laughs> <That's right>. I, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't actually, so I wasn't as conservative as my family was. And, um, you know, I was a little bit taken easy or a little bit free, especially about the clothing. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, I wasn't that much committed to the head cover mm -hmm. that every Muslim woman is asked to wear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was traveling, playing sports, competing, going sometimes to different countries, different cities in my country to represent, you know, my team. And until today, I still remember that my mom's words or advices or, you know, teaching before, it's, it's been repeatedly before every time I'm going to travel, whether for two days or two weeks, that she used to give me the same words, you know, about my religion and the teaching and, you know, you know, your, your religion required this, required that, uh, you know, the authentic, you know, you know you know, all those authentic important things that we learned in school or in a house that 
it was implemented, implemented because you know we're living our life we're, you know we're traveling but we're still Muslim as we're traveling we're going to school but still you know the same thing right we're doing the same thing whether you are wearing what you have to wear or not yeah. so I mean it helped me a lot and it still stick in my mind and absolutely it made me a stronger person whether I look like a Muslim or not but uh, at the age of 23 I came to this country and I thought whoa it was a huge shift in my life yeah uh, I, I had many different uh, religion friends uh, armenian the christian as i told you kurds in in syria we have uh, different uh, different many different people and i mean we all live together yeah. so when i came here it was you know m you know very little muslim people in my life and that was very challenging to me at that time i felt whoa <laughs> th this is different life uh, after a little bit i started you know you know Unfortunately, just after one year, September 11 has happened. So that affected me a lot, a yeah. lot, a lot. So I, you know, I was not sure how to, to live with my identity, the Muslim identity at that time. But at the same time, I was in the same time, you know, work, you know, start to be participating with the mosque, Berlin mosque, also with Sunday school, yeah. um, created more friends around. So I became a little bit stronger and absolutely, you know, the faith will grow with you when you have more friends, more activities, yeah. uh, all of that. And uh, while I was attending school, just you know, to for English second language, I mean, many people were asso associating religion with terrorism. So that was a huge problem in my life. Uh, you know, every time I go home, I I feel I'm lost. I don't know who I am. I am that American. Uh, I don't know, I would have to describe like, look like an American, green eyes or white or uh, with, with no head cover, right, at that time. And or am I that Muslim who always refer to, to be a terrorist? So it was a great challenge. Uh, it wasn't good at all. Uh, but I always, I, f I had the feeling that I can do it. And then this is where the decision came to my mind. And I said, that's it, I'm gonna be wearing the head cover. Mm uh believe me nobody you know especially while wasn't you know my husband he wasn't ready for it he did not want me to to take that step but when when you are in the middle of challenge and you feel that you can do it then you figure out ways to do it really so yeah i started that step and i started <laughs> going to school everybody was shocked in the beginning but i i felt much much comfortable more comfortable being who I am or representing my identity, even though that was a lot of challenges, like people looking at you, first of all, you are different than them. Second of all, you know, at that time, what has happened in September 11 affected everybody. Yeah. So, but still inside me, I was living in ease that I am who I am. Yeah. And uh, maybe I look the way should, I should look. Yeah. So that yeah. helped me, really that helped me, that challenge I went in it, so helped me to be stronger, really. And, and the, uh, the, the, I came here with my faith, I came here with my religion, but I don't know, I mean, I wasn't able to implement it the same way that I'm doing it now, you know, participating in many activities and doing everything that I can do. So, I mean, sometimes those challenges make you stronger, yeah. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. most of the time. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. No, but it sounds like it sounds like a number of things were converging at that same time. Like your identity being in this country um, was shifting, um, but then the community. It sounds like the community at the Berlin Mosque was really, really important to you in those in those moments as well. And then obviously September 11th. Um, but I love the story of you kind of making the decision that um, you know, despite uh, all the um, anti-Islamic stuff that was going on at that time and still goes on um mm -hmm. uh and despite the xenophobia that uh that that americans were displaying at that time you were gonna you were gonna um own your identity um mm -hmm. i think it's a wonderful story yeah it wasn't easy it wasn't <laughs> easy while stopped going with me to any store he used to go with me shopping really fun. my clothes that's it no more <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's it's very if you look at the little uh, details it, it was very challenging but as i told you the inner peace inside you make you stronger and you feel that i, I am doing what 
I'm supposed to do or what's right. So you go over it. Right, 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 right. Um, and Reza, you talked about, um, you know, uh, being raised in, in Sri Lanka and um, yeah, going through this process of reading and reading and reading and reading. Um, yeah, was that, was that a, um, I don't know, it sounds like a really like just incredibly uh, exciting period of life in a way. Um, it was actually, yeah. it's funny, I was, I was actually the youngest in the, in the family, uh -huh. um, but um, I, I really immersed myself. I mean, I was probably, you know, 10, 11 years old when I really immersed myself. And I remember we had, uh, which is very interesting, we had a similar challenge. It was probably about 11 because I left my home for England when I was 13. So before that, so I was probably about 11 or 12. And there was an upheaval in Sri Lanka. It was usually political, yeah. but there was curfew. And of course it was Ramadan. And my parents said, now what do we do? Because we can't, you know, obviously we can't fast, but we can't do the congregational prayers at night. Yeah. And I said, it's okay, I'll do it. I'll lead the prayers. <laughs> and yeah. so wow. my sister, who is one year older to me, who's now my, my closest, but she would make fun of everything. And she was like laughing at me and making fun. And so I said, you know, let's do it. Today's the first night of that. We let's, I'll lead the prayer. Yep. And of course, I just started and she started laughing at the back and, and the whole thing fell apart. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> and there's such nice memories because we continued. And, you know, I continued to lead the prayer and led 20, you know, we pray 20 um, uh, cycles. So it's a very long prayer. It takes about an hour. Ah, wow. And of course, my parents were very supportive of the fact that I was trying to do it. But, um, you know, it it... Even when I came here, I felt like, um, and similar to Sister O'Fran, when 9-11 happened, I went to my group and I said, listen, um, this is a challenging time and I am feeling my identity is very much challenged. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I need to immerse myself more in speaking out about my faith. And if that gets me into trouble, so be it. But I want you guys to know that I'm going to be be much more vocal about my faith and yeah. talking about my faith. And because this is 9-11 certainly doesn't represent Islam in any way, That's right. but we are going to be associated with this. And therefore I need to speak out about my faith. And they were actually amazingly supportive. Mm. Uh, and uh, as I spoke up about my faith, we actually, to my practice, got letters saying, uh, by the way, uh, I'm glad that you have a terrorist among you. I'm changing practice. I'm going to join another cardiology group. I don't want to be a patient with uh, a cardiologist who's a terror. You know, letters like that came to my practice and, and my colleagues really were supportive. They said, so be it. We don't want him. If that's his attitude, we want you to be with us. And, uh, you know, they were awesome in terms of uh, supporting me. And most people were, I don't remember anybody really to my face saying anything evil. There were nasty letters and some phone messages saying, you know, if you want your jihad, because when you become vocal, then people leave nasty messages and stuff. So somehow somebody found out my home phone number and left a message saying, you know, if you want to get 70 virgins in heaven, I can help you with that task. And, you know, just nasty messages. And for Muslims, that 70 virgin thing is a completely concocted uh, saying it's not associated with Islam at all. It's it's a concocted saying uh, attributed to the Prophet. So, you know, all these stereotypes, nasty stereotypes were coming out. But the support we got, at least I got from the people who were close to me was, was really cherished. I loved the fact that they were willing to stand with me uh, in this difficult time. And many nurses came up to me and said, we're so proud of what you're doing and standing up for your faith and speaking the truth to what's turning out to be, you know, a lot of stereotypes against Islam. And yep. That was very, uh, very, very nice to witness. Yeah, 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 I bet it was. Um, I, I can, um, I don't know, my association of, you know, Muslims, especially Muslims at the, the Berlin Mosque, um, is, is that just this outpouring of generosity and, um, hospitality and just this incredible um, uh, show of care. Um, every time I'm there, I feel like I'm, I'm just so openly and warmly and, and 
Yeah. It's true, you know, the Berlin Mosque is unique yeah. in its embrace. I think it's mm -hmm. it's a mosque that I would, you know, I, I feel the most comfortable with. And I've been associated with you know, mosques in Sri Lanka and in England when I was there and then Windsor Mosque. But Berlin is somehow, it's uniquely welcoming and there's a spirit of love there from, you know, among all of the congregants, it's just a very nice place. And I feel, I feel the same about Old Lyme. I feel very much like the congregation is very uh, close-knit and they feel they're supportive of what the leadership wants to do. And it's, it's very nice. It's a, you feel a sense of, you know, something positive is happening. And yeah. that's a nice feeling to have. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I'm glad you feel that way. But um, yeah, I, uh, I, I second that. I, I feel that as well. Um, um, I guess the, my, my point in saying all that is that um, um, what I experience every time I show up at the mosque is in direct contradiction to all of the stereotypes uh, that exist out there um, about Islam. Um, and uh, yeah, you all um, do such a wonderful job. Uh, the two of you, but the whole community does such a wonderful job of um, controverting those stereotypes and showing that Islam is about something totally, totally different yeah. uh, than what the media and other sources present it to be. But listen, I want to I want to get into a couple other things. We don't we can't go forever. But one of the things I know it's Ramadan, um, and uh, I want I want to ask you to talk about that. Tell me about Ramadan, or tell our community about Ramadan. What is it? What um, what do you celebrate when during the during the practice of Ramadan during the month of Ramadan? Um, and what do you do? And what does it mean now during COVID nineteen? What um, how 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 has it changed? Okay, so the month of Ramadan. It's uh, people sometimes think about month of Ramadan. It's uh, the challenging month or you know the tough month and Muslim and Muslim, but really I would love to call it the beloved month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know the whole family look forward to it. Uh, really, from my younger child to the oldest, they all look toward toward and thank God for the mosque. I mean, a lot of activities happening in the mosque that making my children love the activities over there. But also, I mean, the the way that month of Ramadan goes, that uh, so. We fast, you know, Muslim normally fast from dawn to yeah. sunset. Yeah. So there's no eating, no, drink, no, drink, no drinking, sorry, and no um, relation with your partner. And um, so since we are little, we start, you know, we got used to, to practice this. I remember my mom, my dad fasting, and then my, you know, my siblings fasting. So I start to imitating. So in the beginning, it start as, you are imitating, you don't understand what's going on, right? But after that, you start un understanding the concept of it. And, um, you know, in our Quran, it, it's been described. So uh, in our holy book, it says, oh, who you believe, fasting has been prescribed to you and to the nations before you that perhaps they have piety. So after that, you get that, the other concept, what's behind just not eating, not drinking, and all of that, stopping yourself from everything that's allowed in your house. But, um, so it's an amazing month. We, the family gather uh, on two meals. Uh, one of the meals, it's very early in the morning, like somewhere around 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah. It might, be annoying. it might be annoying for you, but I mean, we got used to it and my children, they look forward to it. They make their favorite snack, favorite food. And at the same time, I mean, uh, every mother, uh, you know, maybe, you know, kill herself cooking in the kitchen, all kind of different uh, food, you know, for those, you know, children and the husband who's, you know, spending the whole day fasting. And having the breaking the fast meal all together, it's an amazing feeling. Uh, the whole family, you know, sit together at the same time. Uh, it's 99.9% .9 that none of the members of the family is missing. Everybody gathering at the same time, eating, enjoying, uh, talking nice to each other. It's a part of <laughs> the fasting because if you fast it the whole day, do not ruin your fasting with any, you know, bad saying or any bad word or you know all, all of that yeah, yeah. so so you know overall it's it comes once a year uh we everybody look forward to it and the most important uh, part of it that as soon we finish our breaking the fast meal we have a prayer it's a short prayer and then 
everybody around in the family to clean up, get ready to, to rush to the mosque. And this is where we have the prayer that Brother Riza has mentioned that called Taraweeh. It, it takes two hours. But, you know, imagine yourself in the middle of your own community, your brothers and sisters and everybody around you, you know, uh, having blessings and, you know, congratulating each other on the holy month. We consider this month is very holy. Yes. We, the, yeah, this month is very holy because uh, the holy Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through Gibrail uh, in this month. So, I mean, it's all about the holiest of the, the time of this month. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, thank God, a year after year, I mean, every mosque been improving uh, the services in it. So <clears throat> we have activities for the children. After they pray short prayer, they will go downstairs, have activities yeah. about month of Ramadan. Meanwhile, the adult would be focusing on the spiritual prayers and, you know, uh, supplications. It's an amazing, amazing. And seeing the people you love every day. So I remember myself always asking Brother Riza on the last day of month of Ramadan, say, can, can we extend it, please? It's something that connects the whole community and, uh, you know, leave a wonderful memories for us until the following year. Yeah, yeah. So it's an amazing tie between the, so you know. So every night, uh, uh, everybody gets together to pray every single night? Yeah, every, every night. Yeah. And we, you know, the, the Quran has 30 juice or 30 parts. So we recite one part in these 20 prostrations or 20 cycles, one 30th of the Quran is recited over that uh, every night. So it's, it's an amazing, you know, that, that sense of, uh, you know, companionship, um, brotherhood, sisterhood, you, you can't explain it. It's such an amazing um, feeling of camaraderie that you have when you're uh, there. You know, it's like getting off the carousel of life for a month and just keep, you know, having community for that month. And, right spirituality and contemplation and you know I start my day a little later I start at nine o'clock or ten o'clock in the last ten nights but nine o'clock for the whole month uh -huh. instead of you know seven o'clock meetings <laughs> I start at nine o'clock so it's it's a little later because we wake up at 3 30 as Oprah said and we have a little snack and we have the prayers at that time as well and so you know it's it's the whole material world takes a a seat, a back seat to the spiritual spirituality of this month. I mean, and one of the things I, I really love about the, the month is also um, the, the connection between other faith communities, because the Quran, as Quran said, it says fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed to those before you. So we know that Jesus fasted and Mary fasted and David fasted a lot and Moses fasted and the Jews fast and you know, so it's that connection that we're all in this together. It's not that the Muslims are superior to the Christians are superior. You know, it's not. It's we're all in this together and God will judge us. We're all trying to do the best we can. And God says that in the Quran, strive together to be the best, challenge each other, you know, compete in doing good works with each other. So that's the whole point. God will judge, you know, so we don't have to judge and say he's going to go to hell you know, he's going to go to heaven. No, we can't judge. We're just humans in this, in this journey. But mm. the beautiful thing about this month and all, all the pillars actually is that it doesn't come in isolation. It comes in the tradition of Judaism and Christianity. And we're all in this struggling to build that connection with God, which is the ultimate connection. Yeah. So fasting is prescribed as it was prescribed to you. And as Ufran said, the Quran was revealed in this month, but not just the Quran. The Torah is supposed to be have been revealed in this month, as was the gospel to Jesus in this month. And so all of these books, so divine guidance is what we are fasting for. And we're fasting to God in gratitude for sending, for sending guidance to yeah. all of humanity, for the yeah. Christians who, you know, who are who got guidance, for the Jews who got guidance. So it's it has that thread of unifying us all in this journey of life. Yeah. And that's, that's something unique and something really beautiful that I cherish is the fact that we're not just unique as Muslims, but we are, as a humanity, trying to come together to worship God and to have that connection with God. And yeah, we're on a different 
parallel journey, but it's yeah. just parallel. We're just trying to get to God and we're trying to do it to the best of our ability. That's right, that's right. Um, um, our guest uh, last, last week uh, cited a song by a blues singer called 12 Gates to the City. And he used the image that, that um, look, there are 12 gates to the city, to the holy city. There are many gates. There are several different gates available to you. And so he's going one way, I'm going a different way, but we're trying to get there, all of us together. Mm -hmm. um, so I, anyway, I, I think about that image uh, uh, as you're talking, uh, as we're on these yeah. parallel tracks, making it to perhaps a different gate uh, uh, of, right. the same city, of the same city. Um, yeah. So, so one of the key features of Ramadan is the community, is the being together, the coming together, and obviously um, that's been yanked away this year. Um, and so, what what has what has that meant for all of you? Um, how how have you? I don't know. I love the fact that I love the, I love the fact that Rufran goes first because then she gets first dabs while I think out my answer. You know. <laughs> So let's keep going. <laughs> you go, you go first. Oh, why? <laughs> so, it was bad that I, I took two of the verses that you were thinking of, so I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I, uh, I'll be glad to go first. So, yes, community is very much uh, a part of it, Steve, but ultimately the connection is you with God. And that's the beauty of even our prayer, mm. is that's a conversation between God and you. Mm. And especially in the Fatiha, which is the opening of opening verse of the Quran, mm. it's you praising God first and God stopping everything in, in the, you know, in the, the highest heavens and saying to the angels, hold on a minute, my servant Ofran is calling on me. So everything stops huh. and God can do that with 1.2 or 2.5 billion or whoever who's worshiping God, he can be unique listening to your call mm. and responding to your call and that's the beauty of the prayer to begin with right mm. when we are praying god answers every single phrase that we do so when we say only thee do we worship and only thine aid do we seek god says to the angels bear witness that my servant is not associating anybody in worship with me and then when we say guide us along the right path god says bear witness to the angels God is talking about the individual and saying, bear witness that if my servant worships only me, I will guide him to the right path. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of unique conversation one-on-one -on -one with God uh, is, is something that um, when you do communal prayers, you know, in the mosque, you don't, yes, you do have that connection, but when you're doing it individually at home with your family or by yourself, you're able to contemplate that much more. So I feel that this Ramadan, yes, we've lost out on the community side, but I've gained more in terms of my connection with God, that I was able to contemplate God more in this month than I've ever been able to in this Ramadan, that I've been able to spend more times, you know, crying, really crying in, 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 um, in love of God, in that moment of spiritual bliss that you get very rarely and when you're alone you can actually experience that more than i could have in a mosque because you feel like okay so and so is looking at me i can't really express my spiritual joy or that sense of love of god that actually brings you to tears of of joy not not in a sad way but in a in a very spiritually blissful <laughs> you know, loving way that you cry in, in gratitude to God for all of the gifts that you have gotten, that, uh, that unique uh, connection with God that you were able to express. And in the words of uh, Solomon in the Quran, uh, Solomon prays and says, thank you, God, for making me somebody who's able to express my gratitude. So not just for being grateful, but to be a soul that's able to express gratitude because if you're thankful then you're in a different realm you're not you know looking at rich people and saying could i have that but you're looking at the poorer person and saying you know thank you for giving me more that i may be able to help that person who doesn't have which is a unique experience so i think this ramadan has been uniquely um it has been unique obviously because of the fact that we're socially isolating but i think uh, so finally, Yusuf wouldn't have been here. My son Yusuf would be in Virginia. 
but suddenly he called just before Ramadan and said the, the, the boarding house is closing, so I'm, I'm driving home. And he came in time for Ramadan. And so it was beautiful to have the whole family together. We're eating together. We're praying together. We're, yeah. you know, discussing stuff from the Quran together. Yes. And discussing stories together. What does Islam, what does the fasting really mean? It's not really about hunger and thirst. It's about making yourself a better person, right? The hunger and thirst are just, um, you know, means to kind of wake you up almost. It's to, to tell you, it's don't just be in this rut of, doing everything like a like a robot you know going to work eating lunch you know get out of that realm and just contemplate life for a second yeah. and so we that has been something unique that i really treasure from this month that hasn't been there for other months i miss the community and all of the stuff but sometimes you need time to yourself and this month has been really amazing in that yeah. respect in a way um the way you're describing Ramadan could be, uh, I think, symbolic of what, for many of us, what COVID-19 has done for us, which is to get us out of a rut, to, to force us into a kind of a fast. Um, mm. uh, um, a fast, you know, away from one another, a fast away from our usual activities, a fast from the things that uh, often we, we use to give ourselves meaning and purpose and things like that. We're, some of those things aren't available to us. And if we use the time well, um, I think it can be a time of perhaps, maybe, um, deep spiritual enrichment. Um, it's, it's true. If, if for Fran, you don't mind, I just take one more second. There's a beautiful story of uh, Prophet Muhammad who yeah. used to um, give a lesson and it was done at the dawn prayer time. So, you know, at 3.30 in the morning equivalent, I guess in Saudi Arabia, it's a little later. But he would wake up and he would call the congregation to pray. And then after the prayer, he would give them a pearl, you know, some information. And so he told the community, you know, God has a place for you in heaven way up here while your deeds are here. Mm. And so he said, can you tell me why that is? And the companions were completely, you know, how can that be? You know, if we're doing deeds here, why would God keep a place up here? Yeah. And the prophet ultimately said, well, it's because God throws challenges at you and he sees how you react to them, whether that's the loss of a loved one or whether that's COVID-19 or whatever challenge that is and sees, are you going to make the most out of this or are you going to pine for your loss? Are you going to really embrace this and say, you know what, I'm going to find a unique way and make this challenge something that I can benefit from. And I think that's the challenge that Islam constantly poses on us. You know, take whatever you have and make the best out of it. Yes. And I think that Quranic, um, that's, that's what comes through the Quran when you're reading. It's all these different messengers of God took the opportunities that they had and made the best out of them, whatever that was. And, and that's the challenge that the prophet posed to all of us with that story. And, and it's a unique story. And I think it also helps us get over the, the difficult uh, yeah. uh, hump, bumps in the journey. Yeah, yeah. No, that's beautiful. And yeah, what you shared about um, the tears of gratitude that you experience in prayer, I think it's just profound. I think it's a profound thing. So thank you for sharing that uh, thank you, Steve. With, with us and with uh, everybody who will. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really something that the prophet describes when, uh, when you're in solitude in prayer, mm. something that doesn't really come when you're in community prayer and, and encourages us to be in solitude in prayer. And, and I think that's, that's that bliss of, of that spiritual connection that we yearn for and, and really is freeing and, and an amazing feeling. Yes, yes, yes. Well, Gufran, I want to I want to turn to you a little bit and uh, ask oh. you. Oh, yeah, what what um, I don't know has has Ramadan been uh, um, painful? Not being able, yeah, 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 not being able to be a part of the community in this way, or has community emerged in a different way, or have you experienced something of what Reza is talking about? I mean, I think it's different for everybody. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, I mean, in the beginning, I want to correct something. I don't want to uh, be giving you um, like misguided information, like 
<laughs> we like month of Ramadan because we meet each other for yeah, 30 yeah. days and we eat together or, you know, but also we go over there and we pray for two hours, right? Yeah. So, and, and we, as Brother Riza has mentioned, we read the Quran from A to Z. So mm -hmm. listening to the Holy Quran in this one particular month, and sometimes we have the uh, explanation and, you know, you know, some of the imams give us some extra lessons about yeah. what yeah. was been read uh, through the uh, prayers so that always will make us stronger in in our in our beliefs right so yeah. eventually we will become stronger in life yeah. adding to that adding to that all oh, the joy and uh, the enjoyment of having friends around you neighbors or community members i mean we have been living here for me i have been living here for 20 years so my community it's like a family for me i i have been seen my community more than my family mm -hmm. 10 years i did uh, i i wasn't able to go to syria yeah. so i mean when did i saw last time my sister or my my brother right meanwhile i'm seeing brother Lisa. i'm i'm seeing the other and other and other person so uh, this connection get really stronger but the main goal is to be closer to god not to the people mm -hmm. so i just want to clarify this yeah, yeah yeah i get it i get it uh, yeah okay so i mean it feels weird and <laughs> I want to share with you what Dr. Riza has said. First day of month of Ramadan, you know, I put rules. We're not going to stop what we are doing. So while has to lead the prayer and we have to do exactly the same thing. 20 uh, prayer, uh, hopefully it's not going to take two hours like at the mosque. But I mean, we have to do the same thing. And the first day we started that everybody start laughing. I. For me, I I, I wanna <laughs> I wanna cry because it's different. Yes, we got used to my husband or my oldest kid, uh, you know, to to lead in the prayer. But we felt just for this particular prayer, we got used to to pray at the mosque. We got used to, to pray behind yeah. Imam, not my husband, not my oldest son. So it it is different. Uh, Sometimes when I'm you know the the mosque offering a wonderful activity. So one of the activities that we um, we are able to watch uh, the Imam praying uh, okay. part of the prayer uh, through the Facebook. And sometimes while I'm watching, you know, I just, you know, uh, fear and tears, you break in tears because, I mean, this is a place I used to go every day. This is a place that here where I used to pray and here where I used to call my child. I mean, a lot of memories. So I start crying and my son will be looking at me. What's going on? What did happen? You know? Uh, so it, it, it's not easy it's totally different but with the time going like day after day i start realizing the positive side of it mm -hmm. i hate to say that positive side of covid19 but it is there is positive side let's say only let, let's yep. talk about the small uh, thing which is my family so now my kids they're not going like six seven hours every day to school so i am focusing on them i am spending time with them one-on-one -on -one doing homework with them, going outside, running with them, playing, um, learning Arabic, learning Quran. We're praying five times a day, which is we never had that chance, unless maybe weekend, because they go to school and they have to sleep early. So normally they miss the first and last prayer yeah, yeah. Uh, due to the school uh, situation. So it's amazing <laughs> opportunity for us to, to practice our religion in the right way during this COVID-19 situation. And um, on top of that, I hate to say it. So I shared it with one of my friends. I said, I don't want to say that I'm in favor of COVID-19 sometime. This is how I feel. Because if I look at my country, if I look at Yemen, if I look at Palestine, if I look at many suffering countries of war, this small uh, virus, was able to stop the corrupt people in this world and stop wars and stop killing. We are tired seeing bloodshed. Yeah. We are tired seeing civilians getting killed for reason or for no reason. Yes. Uh, we have Assad here who's killing people. We, we have Putin there and, and it's not gonna finish. No one can stop those people and see with the, with the little virus that we cannot even see in our eyes. He was, you know, it was able to stop all the corruption. That's very interesting, Gufran. That's a very interesting insight. You know, it's bringing tears to my eyes because we were waiting for this to happen. You know, it's been 10 years killing in Syria. Hmm. And nobody, nobody from the wise men 
we were able to stop in the sake of the children, in the sake of the women, in the sake of the widows. Yeah. Stop it, enough is enough. But no one were able to help, not only the Syrians, the Yemeni people, the Palestinian people for how many years, 70 years and, and more. So welcome COVID-19 if, if it's gonna stop the killing. Yeah. I'm sorry to say it this way, that's, but- That's an interesting perspective. I love hearing that. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. a contradict. I, I hate to see one person, one person in the world suffering. I know, right? I, I totally or totally any other yeah. uh, harming, you know, viruses. But look at the world. People behaved. People did behave in many ways. So, to be honest, maybe because I'm Syrian, maybe because I'm from the Middle East, uh, and when we are witnessing a lot of unjust in our country, so the COVID nineteen came as a savior. But absolutely, the savior is God. It's coming from God with the, with His will. So this is how I'm looking at it. Absolutely, I miss my um, mosque. Absolutely, I miss the community. But I'm looking at it as a positive way that I am with my family. Thank God we're all healthy and we're doing what we want to do. Yep, Gufran, that's that's one that is one of the most interesting and original um, perspectives on COVID that I've that I've heard in these conversations. Mm. I, think it's I, I hope people won't take a bad expression of me saying this word. But oh, no, 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 no. I no. no. I, I think. I, and certainly I, I trust everybody out there who's listening and watching um, will, will absolutely, your meaning will be clear. I mean, nobody, nobody wants disease, nobody wants uh, a virus to be unleashed. However, insofar as it stopped violence um, mm. and brought that to a standstill and brought that injustice to a standstill, that's very interesting. Sure. Um, so let's, let's, um, let's, we need to wrap this up, but I wanna, I wanna ask one final question to both of you. And that has to do with the, the stuff that we've been getting into, um, uh, which is, you know, I, th I think a value that we share our two faith communities, certainly the three of us as individuals. Um, um, I, would, I would argue that, uh, that Islam and Christianity hold, um, um, both hold sacred, um, um, uh, at least the best parts of those traditions, um, are, are values of social justice and, um, um, taking care of the most vulnerable um, and standing up for what we know to be right. Um, so I guess I'm curious to hear from the two of you, what, what do you see as the challenges before us in terms of uh, our common social justice commitments right now? Um, do you have a sense of that? Um, where, things are, where things are unfolding right now in, uh, in this world of COVID-19? So, mm -hmm. so if sorry, talk, go ahead. Sorry, okay. If, um, if I'm gonna talk about my own small uh, experience. So, I mean, as a mother, now I'm focusing on my first job, right? As a mother, raising my own five children. So I made sure uh, during this pandemic that to, to enlighten my children about what's going on in the world and how we are blessed. You know, if we compare ourselves with, many other people, many other nations, uh, you know, those suffering lands of occupation or suffering land of corruption, wars. So, you know, I, I brought it to the mind of my children that we are blessed, you know, no matter what we see in the front of us uh, due to the pandemic, but we still, we are blessed. We, so we have to, to live the, the feeling of gratitude that God has chosen us to be in a place that we're having a lot of blessings that many others that does not have access to. At the same time, I tried my children to participate in helping in any way, like to reach out to an organization, a humanitarian organization, or anything like that to help one Syrian child or one Palestinian child or, you know, Yemeni or African. Yeah. So I, I tried my best to implement that feeling in their heart that if we are fine and if we are saved here, then let's save others. I don't want them to feel that we are in Cancun and, and we're safe, so forget about the rest of the world. Right. And, you know, just, you know, by bringing the, this subject, you know, allow me to share with you my gratitude that how is the, you know, the COVID-19 or, or what's going on now in the world brought also that our two communities together. Thank God we've always been together, the church and the mosque, thank God. But also, I mean, look at it now. Uh, the community of the Old Lyme and the community of Berlin Mosque working together, uh, supporting uh, many projects uh, in Palestine. Look yes. at Gaza also. Right. So 
you know, thank God we were in a project. A Tree of Life has started the project of a food basket for the Palestinians. Yeah. Thank God we were uh, able to support them with around ten thousand dollars and more. And then as soon as this project ends, we came to another project with it, which is in Gaza, Gaza uh, Relief. So to see the church and the mosque next to each other, helping each other, the same communities feeling uh, the pain of each other and feeling the pain of the people on the other side of the world. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's what I love. It's what I love about the mosque and it's what I love about uh, our partnership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for that. Reza, take us out, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think the essence of Ramadan is to make you think, you know, it's supposed to make you contemplate. It's supposed to make you think, okay, why am I not eating? It's because you want to, you want to feel the, the hunger pangs of those who don't have so that you can give. So it's supposed to make you think about the least among us and, you know, Yes, of course, the Middle East, uh, there are lots of people. But just here in Hartford, we have so many people who don't have. Uh, one of the beautiful things that the Muslim Coalition, the, the other organization I'm really proud of, is that every single week, they supplied food to 270 homeless people who are now put in hotels. So every week, one day, we fed them all. Nice, and nice. and it, was, it, was, it was amazing to see how much the Muslim community gave towards that project. As soon as we announced the date, we were going to do it once in the whole month. As soon as we announced the date, it was full and people were like, that's not fair. We wanted to give. So we said, okay, then we'll, ex we'll increase it. We'll do one day a week. This is, what I hear. this is what I know to be true of the Muslim community. Always. I mean, it's amazing that yeah. uh, I think it's the faith communities, but I think COVID-19, uh, just to back up what Sister Hofran said, I think it has the same effect. Mm. It's supposed to make us think. Mm. And it's supposed to make us think, okay, do we really need to be killing each other in these wars and yes. these drone attacks and stuff? Yes. Can we just take a break and just work together yes. and just tell the politicians enough, you know, let's just try to work together. And I think it should come from us, the faith communities, that we work together and we show them just like as Hufran said, we did in Palestine and then in Gaza and 10,000 in one, 10,000 in the other. I mean, the people are willing to support it. Yes. And then we tell the politicians, listen, we don't want the killing. We don't want right. the invasions of Iraq and, you know, that stuff, the drones in Yemen. I mean, let's just stop. And it's not that I'm saying it's just what America does. It's what the Saudis are doing. It's what, you know, it's just this, uh, I don't know, we're just... We're just getting lost in, in the killings and the deaths and stuff. At some point, we need to, and maybe COVID-19 is God saying to us, take, you know, look at what really is important. Are you, are you, is it, are you serious about building all these more and more powerful weapons or should you be helping each other? Because when I send a little virus, you all are all on your knees and on your faces prostrating saying, you know, what, what do we do? 85,000 people in the most powerful country in the world are dead. Yes. And should, should that be a, a moment of reflection for us? I think it should. I think we have a unique opportunity as faith communities in leading that effort. And I think yeah. we should do it more and more and speak out more and more in terms of saying enough, enough of the killings. Let's work towards uh, having a brotherhood that supersedes or transcends color and ethnicity and religion and we work together and try to alleviate the poverty. I think that's the essence of religion itself is to, yes. to be a force for good as Jesus taught us all in the way he lived his life. The essence of his life is trying to take care of the poorest and the, you know, the immigrant and the refugee as he was. Uh, and that's exactly the essence of the Quran too, telling us, you know, you've got to, and, and the life of Prophet Muhammad too, and all of the messengers, right? Moses was a refugee. He took his people out of Egypt. Abraham was a refugee, he was born in Iraq, transferred, you know, came to Egypt and then to Jerusalem and then to Mecca. And then, you know, he was, they didn't live a luxurious life. They lived with the poor and they set an example. And can we really follow that example of, oh, are we going to get into this, you know, we're better than them and have this hubris about, 
who we are rather than really the humility of being a human being that ends up six feet under the feet of everybody else. Yeah, yeah. You guys are dropping pearls right now. <laughs> this is great. There's a, there's a reason I love talking to both of you. There's also a reason that, uh, that I say, Reza, you are my imam. And there's a reason that I say to you, Gufran, uh, that you are my president. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and, and more respect to you also. Exactly, yeah. Oh, well, listen, really, I, I missed the trip to Palestine I know. Uh, largely because I, both of us said to each other, we'll be able to have more of these conversations That's about right. faith. Uh, Steve, you, yeah. you have that unique ability to bring us, bring us to this, this point. So thank yeah. you for inviting us to this conversation. Oh, you are welcome. Um, let me close um, by just I'll direct this to everybody out there watching and just I just want to share the story of um, a time that that Reza and Gufran and I spent. This is now an infamous and not, not infamous, but uh, a famous uh, um, time that we spent a, at Petra. Um, and we just happened upon one another as we were walking around these ruins and we spent the better part of an afternoon. Um, just talking and walking and drinking coffee and Reza and Gufran just shared story after story with me uh, about the prophet, about sayings of the prophet, about the Islamic tradition. And I felt like it was this wonderfully sacred moment um, that the three of us got to share together. Um, and I will always remember that. And I look upon this as a kind of recreation of that in some ways. So I want you to know that I look um, to both of you um, as uh, companions on my own faith journey and, um, and I love you both. And it's so, so good to be able to be with you even virtually in this time. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. We, I feel exactly the same. I feel we're on this journey together and you've enriched my journey uh, by being who you are. So thank you for uh, having this close relationship on a personal level, but also from the mosque and the church. Uh, it, it's something I cherish. So thank you for all right. keeping us in. Thank you to both of you. Uh, thank you and stay safe, uh, all of you and uh, everybody at home too. God's blessings and peace to you all and stay safe. All right. Thank you so all much. Right. Looking Take forward to it. Good to be with you. Thank you. God all bless. Right. All right. Bye. Bye bye. To all of you out there, we'll see you next time. Love in the time of Corona to you. Bye.